Hey folks, Darren with Fervent Astronomy. Something a little bit different today. This is a Canon EOS M6 Mark II. And this is actually a modified version of that camera, uh, which I modified. I'm not sure if I remembered to record that modification, but if so, I will have a video up on that, or there will be one up on that at some point. But uh, this camera came out not too long ago, actually, just like a few years ago, I want to say 2018, 2019, and it has the same sensor as the Canon EOS 90D. And both of those cameras, I think, share the same basic sensor with now Canon's R7. I got there. But you know what? If you are the type of person to already own this camera, if you're taking advantage of the fact that Canon is kind of discontinuing these, uh, and you know you can get a good deal or find one used, you might want to pick one up. And whether or not you modify it, you might find that it's good for astrophotography because it's got a really high resolution sensor, especially for APS-C up until the Fuji X-T5 and X-H, X-H2, I think, released with that 40 megapixel sensor. This, I believe, 33 megapixel sensor was the highest resolution APS-C sensor on the market. This camera's nice and light. It's really tiny, really small, and the modification wasn't actually that difficult. That being said, I wouldn't recommend modifying a camera, at least not one, you know, in this price range if you haven't done it before. It's really a skill that you'd want to work on with something like a, a Rebel T1 or something like that to get your feet wet. But I do encourage you to go down that road if you want because it is a fun hobby. It can be you know, really rewarding. I enjoy doing it. No camera in this house is safe for me and my set of screwdrivers. Japan Industrial Standard screwdrivers, JIS uh, specifically, you need those for taking apart these cameras. At any rate, in this particular case, I have a astronomic original white balance type three filter. Essentially, since we removed the color correction filter, the uh, white balance filter, that's usually the one that eats up more of that hydrogen alpha band. You can get one of these little clip-in filters, put it back in, and then restore the camera basically to stock functionality uh, where you can you know, take normal daytime photos. So that's what I've done here, and it's something that I would encourage. But how does this camera perform? Is it good for astrophotography? Well, I did modify it, so let's find out. Hey folks, welcome to Lightroom, where today we're going to talk about the, I guess now discontinued, Canon EOS M6 Mark II. When it was launched, along with the Canon 90D, we had the densest APS-C size sensors on the market at 32 megapixels. That means that if you extrapolated this up to a full frame sensor keeping the pixel density, get something like an 80 megapixel full frame sensor. So these were really, really dense. They've been superseded now by some of the Fuji cameras, the X-T5 and the X, I think the X-H2. Yeah, that's like a 40 megapixel APS-C size sensor, although it is a 1.5 crop as opposed to Canon's 1.6 crop. So this one's a little bit smaller, retains some density. Anyway, all that being said, this is a really dense sensor and high resolution by any metric. And can it be used for astrophotography? Sure it can. Every camera can be used for astrophotography. They've been all great for a while. So we're not going to worry about how quote unquote good this is. We're just going to talk a little bit about the camera and look at some samples. Uh, these samples may, some of them may be made available for you to peruse. Uh, just check the link in the description. Along with that, you'll find some useful articles and you will find, uh, of course, some information on the Fornax Mounts Light Track 2, which is uh, a really bomb-proof portable tracker. If there's any tracked samples in here that I'm going to provide, they will have been tracked with that tracker because Fervent Astronomy is Fornax's North American distributor. One thing I do have to say regarding any samples that will be made available, please keep in mind this is my copyrighted work, even if they're not you know, overly uh, amazing works of art. They do represent my hard work, so please respect that. Please only use these samples to assess the uh, camera itself and, you know, the associated optics if you'd like. Please don't redistribute the files anywhere. Please don't misrepresent them as your own. Please don't use any of these samples as a basis for your own review. All that common sense stuff. Please just use them in good faith for the purposes that I'm providing them. 
all that being said, usually the last thing I, I uh, throw out there is a little bit of a talk about ISO invariants. And you might find that many, if not all, of these are shot. Well, that one's not, but that, anyway, uh, many or all of these are shot at a very specific ISO. That's because a lot of cameras these days have what's called ISO invariant sensors, where they only have a couple of analog amplification stages in their sensor, which is what ISO values are supposed to represent, and the rest are all digitally simulated, which is exactly the same thing as if somebody came up here and just boosted the exposure in post. Why is that important? Well, let's say you clip the highlights in a star or aurora or something, and then go to try and recover them. You might find that you're left with no real information in the highlights. So if you're shooting at ISO 10,000 or something like that. But if 10,000 just happened to be one stop along a track of ISO invariants, maybe if you use that base ISO, you might be able to recover the highlights a little bit more while also still capturing the exact same amount of information in the frame. So having the same level of noise, having the same ability to boost the shadows, everything you expect, same, same, but maybe the ability to recover some highlights. So that's why I do that. That link that I mentioned back to fervinastronomy.com, there's an article that talks all about that there as well if you wanna learn more. Well, we'll just pop in here. I don't know what all these are. So right here, a couple from 2021, and then here from 2023, this represents uh, a point after which I had modified this camera, which is why this looks really red, but we'll go in here. This was pre-modification. Uh, one of the things about this camera that I do like is that I was able to get clip-in filters for it from Astronomic, which happens to be another brand that Urban Astronomy sells. And because of that, I now have a modified camera that I can just pop in a, a filter to return back to stock values and stock color reproduction. So that's really great. This is a two minute exposure with the Red Cat 51, which uh, my Red Cat, uh, I believe this is back when there was a tilt in the sensor and I wasn't, well, not that there was a tilt that I hadn't rectified, sort of threw things out of balance. It looks like a little bit of field curvature here. It's not really, it's just that I was not very smart. So here's a great tip. Don't use an optic for literal years. And then since you have no time, never really look at the photos too close and then find out that, oops, <laughs> there is a tilt that I could have just adjusted easily and fixed, which has since been fixed. But anyway, that's a, uh, if there's a thing that I do, that is going to be a typical thing. It's going to be a Darrenism. All right. So here we can see North American Nebula, Pelican, and decent amount of, of reds let in. Canon traditionally, their sensor filters let in a, a fairly decent amount of red, at least the hydrogen alpha emission. Decent is decent compared to other brands, but not an overly large amount in this case. So it was worth it to me to modify the camera. Here we are at f4.9. This is ISO 1600. So here is a case where I would have baked some blown highlights in, especially out here with Deneb that I wouldn't have needed to had I shot at uh, 320, I believe, but hey, it looked good on the back of the camera. So that's what we want, right? The screen on the back of this camera has a little bit of articulation, but it doesn't point forward. And that makes it a little bit rough to use when you're using it at, at odd angles, such as if Cygnus is, is up at Zenith or something like that. When it's more of a wide angle shot like this, you know, it's a little bit easier. For anyone interested, this is the old Tokina 11 to 16 f2.8, still basically the only option for a fast wide angle lens. And look at this astigmatism, ugh, so bad. <laughs> but that's all you got, you're warping through space. This, uh, this particular image, it also has a ton of chromatic aberration, which luckily the profile cleans right up. But this particular Aurora, comes from a day where it was supposed to be, you know, just going off all night long and it didn't until the morning. This is like, what time is this? Seven o'clock in the morning. So the Aurora finally started to show up in earnest as the sun rose and washed everything out, tried to recover some here and it, it just looked terrible. So this is an abandoned shot, but you know, it gives you an idea about the, the level of noise and whatnot. So pretty, pretty okay considering how dense this APS-C sensor is. You are going to deal with more noise than you're typically going to with a, let's say a 30 megapixel full frame. Let's look at this shot here. This is the Canon 8 to 15 millimeter f4 fisheye zoom lens here at, I guess, eight millimeters, giving us a circular fisheye-ish. 
and this was during the Pleiades one year, I believe, yeah, last year. 15 second exposure here, and obviously I haven't done anything to this frame. So here for about as wide as you can possibly expect, this is one of those cases where I left the ISO value kind of high, but it is what it is. F4, 15 seconds, quite dark. We're gonna get a lot of noise. A lot, a lot of noise in here, right? But a lot of noise in the quote unquote foreground, I guess. Um, but you know, that wasn't necessarily the point of this. Actually, I haven't really played with these at all. Let's try and correct a little bit of this out. So this is something where I would most definitely toss some noise reduction. I'm probably gonna leave the frame black here, and this is a time lapse. So with a little bit of noise, people aren't gonna always pay too much attention if the frame's moving. It's not gonna disrupt things. So that being said, very, very crunchy. Definitely want to use longer exposure times, or uh, if you can get away with it, uh, tracking to get a longer exposure time. This is again, using the fisheye lens, but you'll notice that it's at f2.8 at this point. This is because I have a speed booster from, I think it was a Viltrox speed booster actually. So it's speeding the lens up a little bit. I still get circular fisheye, which is nice. And um, yeah, I need to do something with these frames, basically. There's, there's a lot going on there. I put it on a light track too, but pointed straight up at Zenith so that there'd be some rotation in the frame in the uh, quote unquote foreground here. So I think this could be pretty cool, but this camera is gonna benefit from faster optics or longer exposure times if you can. Here, six seconds at f2.8 is, I mean, is okay because the Aurora is so bright, but definitely the foreground here is, despite being fish-eyed into mush, uh, really, really crunchy. These are 180 seconds. I don't know what this is. I think this is probably the Red Cat 71. Uh, this was in August. This was at a star party. Lagoon and Triffid Nebulae. Bump the exposure a little bit. Did I use... I might not have used the camera in a modified configuration. It looks like maybe I used the white balance, the normal white balance filter in it. But let's kind of see what we got here. It's a little too green, too warm, still a little too... Oh, maybe a little warmer. Pretty decent detail. Here we've got, this is socked in at 400%, mind you. So Lagoon, got some of the dust lanes. This is a very dense sensor, so we do get a lot of good resolution. You can use some wider field optics, such as the Red Cat 71, which is a 350 millimeter optic, I believe. And yeah, not too bad for three minute exposure, 180 seconds. So yeah, pretty okay. This is gonna clean up. This would stack out nicely as well. One nice thing about using a crop sensor with this type of thing is you do get rid of the edges. So even though the optics are, you know, a lot of these ones are with the Petzval designs are advertised as being perfectly flat from edge to edge. It's not always 100% perfect. And here, if we're using the center crop, not only are we getting a really high resolution photo, but the actual optic itself can keep up with the resolution so we can get a, a really decent amount of detail in some of these nebulae. So this will be interesting if I ever get around to doing anything with it. And this is where this camera, I think, actually shines and does a really good job. Uh, it is you know, a very high resolution APS-C camera. It's tiny. The battery sucks. The battery life sucks. And uh, you can't run it off USB power. So you have to get a dummy battery. But you know these things are, are cheap and plentiful online. And then you can run it for hours and hours and hours and it's no issue but then you have an extra cord and anyway, but the tiny little batteries are small and annoying, but if once you hook it to like a big giant pack, you're, you're gold in there, but it pr produces really nice images. I don't know that I would say that there's any spatial filtering going on with this camera. These stars seem mostly like stars. They're not getting too wonky and there is obviously a lot of noise. So this might be one of, uh, you know, the only mirrorless Canon cameras that do not feature spatial filtering. Spatial filtering being an algorithmic type of noise reduction that can kind of play havoc with stars. All brands use some version of it. Basically, uh, most raw images these days aren't raw raw, they're kind of cooked raw. And oh, here we have, I think same, but with the modified configuration here. Here's a nice example. This is what this camera looks like modified and try and adjust that temperature out a little bit 
course, because I'm me, I never do what I should do and uh, take some proper color balance frames. <laughs> so it is what it is. Look at that. Nice and red and magenta-y. Look, ooh, so smooth. Got some chromatic aberration here. So here's a direct comparison between modified and unmodified. Here we can see on the right, we've got a lot more of that blue coming through. Now, I 100% understand that the white balance is all over the map here and we're just gonna have to deal with it but definitely you're getting more magenta happening here in the modified camera you really are benefiting from that hydrogen alpha emission the trifid so i'm glad i modified it it's i think it was a good choice uh, for me personally and having those clip and filters from astronomic were really useful So what else is there really to say about this camera? I mean, it's a camera. Because it's mirrorless, it can connect to basically anything and it can connect natively to all the Canon EF lenses. If you have the associated adapter, you can use third-party adapters, such as like the, the one I mentioned, the Veltrox Speed Booster, and use different optics in different ways, maybe different interesting ways, such as that circular fisheye that I had shown. So it's a fun little piece of kit. And considering Canon has sunset the EFM series, you might be able to find this camera uh, for a good deal used somewhere. I'm going to imagine there might be some new stock floating around still somewhere, but overall days are numbered if there is, and might be a good thing to consider some lenses if you want to have a, a nice camera just for general stuff, because you don't need to have a modified camera. The unmodified version is perfectly cromulent, and it's a good little camera. The autofocus is actually good. Like it, it's a good multi-purpose camera, very small and light and makes a good astro cam. That's the, the end of this. Let's get out of Lightroom here and wrap it up. All right. As should be no surprise with any reasonably modern camera, uh, especially one with a newish sensor like this, it's pretty good. Uh, you know, when you do get a high resolution sensor, especially when it's an APS-C sensor and you've got really small, what's called pixel pitch, basically the pixels are really tiny, you do start to get fewer photons per pixel. And that means you're getting proportionally less signal over time which in the case of astrophotography specifically can really be of importance. Signal to noise ratio, even though modern sensors are really good, is still a concern, right? We do want to get that signal. So by having smaller pixels, they're each getting fewer photons per unit time as compared to, let's say, a 33 megapixel full frame sensor. And you know what? You get proportionally more noise, but I think this sensor actually still does really well, especially if you expose properly. The remedy for all of this is just to get a proper exposure. So in our case, tracking time, making sure that we've got, you know, good enough tracking time or fast apertures is going to keep things under control. And because it is a really dense sensor, you know, high megapixels, that noise is going to appear smaller when viewed at a normal viewing distance for the size of the photo. So it's going to look like film grain a little bit, a little more natural. If you have, you know, an old 12 megapixel sensor, for instance, the noise can be very blotchy. The noise is going to look smaller in the higher resolution photo when viewed at the same size, basically. So that's always good to keep in mind. And uh, yeah, I hope you found that interesting. It's a little bit of a novelty. Uh, hopefully the modification video will be up on, uh, on my channel if I remember to take it. We'll find out. If it's not there, you can see others for instance canon 6d uh, mod and uh i think at this point i've got a sony a7r4 modification as well if they're of interest to you if you're that kind of nerd uh, by all means dig into it but thanks so much for your time i'm darren take care